I'm Estelle Bingham, and this is the Love Purpose Connection podcast. Here on Love Purpose Connection, I want to explore how to discover and really develop the secrets of a good life. I'm a holistic therapist and healer, and so over this series, I'll be sharing frank, inspiring, sometimes raw, often joyful conversations with a different guest each time, exploring just what those three words really mean, and also, crucially, how you can discover and develop them in your own life. Today, I'm talking to writer, yoga teacher, stylist and coach, Roxy Nafusi. After years of living a hedonistic lifestyle in her early 20s, fueled by partying and compulsive eating, Roxy said she found herself at rock bottom. She suffered depression and in 2016 decided to open up about all of this through her writing and sharing a new approach that worked for her, which included yoga and mindful eating. She said she spent the whole of her 20s going through constant cycles of binging and restricting. There isn't a diet I haven't tried, she says. I now have a much healthier relationship with food. What really intrigues me about Roxy is the way that process of healing herself is so deeply connected to her work healing others as a coach and as an ambassador for the Mental Health Foundation. Recently, she's made a decision to take a new step to go even deeper into her self-healing journey. Roxy Nafusi, welcome to Love Purpose Connection. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Estelle. It's such an honour. I'm really over the moon to have you here this week because we haven't really met properly, have we? We've kind of met over Zoom or, you know, we've done sort of like a, an online session. But it's just been wonderful to have that one connection with you. And I really got inspired by your energy, all your manifesting, incredible. Yeah, I live and breathe manifesting. I really do. Anytime I have an opportunity to talk about it or meet someone that understands it and connects with it is just really, um, it's so exciting for me. Yeah. So you're 30, Roxy. Yes. And you've just sort of completely turned your life around, haven't you, in in the past... How many years has it taken for you to kind of go from one narrative to a new story? I would say, I said, my, I'll always look at, I can always know from my son's age. My son is 20 months and uh, it was really from about three months after he was born, I would say, that I suddenly went, okay, I'm going to do this. And then everything just changed. My life two years ago was very, very different to how it is now. I feel like my life has just begun. It's really exciting. (laughs) So tell me about what it was like having Wolf. So Wolf was pretty unexpected. I was 28 and I had only known Wolf's dad, Wade, for three months when I found out that I was eight weeks pregnant. And he is from Australia. We had not a single mutual friend. We were, of course, in that sort of honeymoon. I've always struggled slightly with commitment, actually. You know, I suddenly thought, oh, well, this is as big a commitment as they get. And I hardly know this person. And I was still very much in the depth of trying to find out who I was. I still hadn't really come to terms with my cocaine addiction that was still there. So it was suddenly having to deal with that. Um, I was smoking 25 cigarettes a day when I found out I was pregnant. I had no career, really nothing. So I was not in a good way. And then the de- pregnancy itself was it was pretty traumatic, actually. It was probably the darkest time of my life. I literally didn't leave the house for about six months. I didn't see anyone. I gained six stone because I was comfort eating. I just thought my life was worthless. I didn't wasn't ready to be a mom. Um, and then when I had Wolf, it wasn't like an overnight, I'm so in love. This is what I always wanted. What was I worried about? You know, it grew. Actually, what happened was I had to learn to love myself first. And from that, I had the capacity to love my son. And that's why my first workshop actually was self-love, because I realized that even my own son, I couldn't love truly without loving myself first. 
And that showed me the importance of self-love for all our relationships in our life. What does it look like today, Roxy? I am just head over heels. He is, he's my soulmate. Like he is the love of my life. I just adore him. He is just his own person. And every day, I just that bond just gets stronger and stronger. And I love watching him grow. I, I belly laugh with him. Like, you know, like when you're a child, he takes me back to that childlike state that, that pure joy that I used to think you could only get on drugs. I used to think you have to go out and take drugs to feel high. And now I could just sit with my son and uh, just watch him play. And, and I get something much, much better than that. So this real deepening into love and growing and, and like we said, sort of this kind of healing, amazing gift that you're giving to Wolf too, by default. You know, what? tell me a little bit about your journey to sobriety. I mean, because you talked about, you know, obviously the cocaine addiction and to turn that around so quickly, that's quite powerful for, for some of our listeners. So tell us a little bit about that, how you did that. Well, it was quick in the end, but the lead up to it was very, very long. I mean, I first went to an NA, Narcotics Anonymous meeting when I was 22. So I had a problem long before I managed to overcome it. Um, and I I went through many stages of trying to give up, then trying to moderate, then giving up, a lot of rock bottoms. There was a, it was a very, very long journey. But I read somewhere once about this experiment with rats. And the experiment was that if you gave a rat cocaine, they would press the button to receive it until they died. But if you put the same rats in rat heaven, essentially, where they had a playgrounds and you know and fun and and food and all these other things they didn't do that so I suddenly thought to myself ah okay so maybe this is context related maybe this isn't just that I'm an addict maybe it's that my life is not how I want it to be and maybe I need to work on all those parts of of my life rather than just looking at this addiction and so I just got to work, indulged myself 100% in self-development. I read, I went on a yoga retreat, I did my yoga teacher training, I listened to every podcast you could imagine, I, I immersed myself in every way possible and I just went all at it and I used uh, the pain of the pregnancy to help me find meaning and the thing I think that really changed everything for me was doing a job that I loved. Nothing was worth, no, no, nothing was worth fucking that up, you know? So this idea of mental health and, and what we can do to create positive and powerful mental health every day. So you're saying exercise and food that they feel like as a, as a starter for people, right? Definitely. I think that when you look at how you feel, the first questions you should ask yourself are, how are you fueling your body and how are you moving it? Because what we feed our bodies is affecting our mood. And I think that the link between our physiological body and our mental body and our emotional body is all so immensely intertwined. And it's an easy step to take first, actually, to just go, you know what, why don't I just stop feeding myself with foods that bring me down, that make me feel sluggish, and actually fuel myself with things that will energize me, fuel me, nourish me. And let's see what that does. Let's see what moving my body does. Let's see what, you, you know, feeling better physically does for, for myself. Start there. Why not? You've got nothing to lose, but I guarantee it will make you feel better. What is it that you do to get yourself out of bed and moving? I always start my day with my favorite cup of coffee. Okay. Because that gets me up. Oh my goodness, every morning. I get up, I have a ritual, you know, I get up, I know that I'm going to go and make a drink, you know, even if you don't like coffee or hot tea or whatever, I have a morning ritual. So that that's the starter. And then I move in some way. So I love running in the summer. And some mornings I wake up and I can't be bothered to do a spin or a bar or whatever. But I know that I can always do something. So 
it's saying to yourself, okay, let me just do 15 minutes and see how I feel. Because once you're 15 minutes in, you might be like, oh, you know what? I can do another 15. But it's about being intuitive and committing, committing to yourself, even if the weather is bad, even if it's dark outside. You have to make a commitment to yourself that you want to feel your best, that you want to act in ways that are self-loving and moving your body and nourishing it is self-love. This idea of commitment is very important, isn't it? This idea of showing up. We just have to keep showing up. And it's so painful sometimes. And that's kind of where our growing edge is. It's like, oh, those days where it's really tough to show up. And and then there are certain areas where we can show up more and then certain areas where we show up less. And you mentioned, we were just chatting before we got recording, that I'm the first person you've committed to seeing regularly, Oxy, which I was, I'm very honoured about. Tell me a little bit about what that feels like to commit to yourself in that way or to commit to a certain level of inner work in that way. I think often you do all the things that you can to help yourself first. That's for me the first step. And I've done those things. I've done a lot of those things. You know, I I eat healthily, I read, but there's still some wounds that need healing, deep ones. And then I can go, okay, this isn't something that I can do on my own. This is something I want help with. And I think for a lot of people, any kind of therapy, no matter what kind, it's an investment financially, energetically, and often, and I have in the past dismissed it, but actually just going, do you know what? I've done a lot of it. And now maybe I just owe it to myself to try and let somebody else help me here. You are the first person I committed to also because I felt a very good connection with you. I felt that you honestly, for the first time, I have a lot of deep insecurities about the way I look. For the first time after our session, I haven't berated myself once since our session. So it's it's been something really, something a shift. And, you know, I think it is like speed dating with therapists or healers or anything. You have to find what fits for you. And then when you do, the commitment is easier. And it's also time, isn't it? It's your spirit is saying, we've done all of this, which is wonderful. And it's your next level. And then you're going to give that back to everyone that you work with. And it's that kind of, it's it's time to give something back to yourself. Like you say, go back to into some of those original wounds and emerge more courageous and and because it takes a lot of courage to go back to those places and we have to decide that we can you know that we just we're going to show up in a courageous way for ourselves even when it just feels like it's the last thing we really want to do because it feels like it could be it could get messy and it and it does get messy but it's about those shifts like you say it's stepping into the unknown absolutely yeah, I think that's that's completely right. So tell me a little bit about your early story, Roxy, because I found it so fascinating. You were born in Jeddah to Iraqi parents, and then you moved to Oxfordshire when you were five. And what I feel is so powerful is, is your story around bullying and, and how that affected you and, and what happened there, and especially because so many people are affected by, by bullying and we really internalise those stories. What happened there for you? Well, I was sort of, I was outcast really from year three so I don't I must have been about seven so I was always out because I went to a posh English school uh you know in Oxford and I was Arab and my name was it well is Rowan and stood out and there was definitely um casual racism from from them I think and um I definitely always felt very much the outsider then but then anyway then I moved schools and then when I was 11 and the Iraqi war broke out. So suddenly, you know, Saddam Hussein, everybody is associating basically all Iraqis with him. And I would be locked in phone boxes. I was, I was subject to quite horrific bullying. 
for about two years that I can remember were pretty traumatic. And on top of that, I had these kind of two girls in the year above me who essentially sort of, I just sound so dark, but, you know, saying, telling me things like to slip my wrists and things like that. So it was pretty fucked up, to be honest. And when I went to the teachers for help, they um, essentially gave me none and said, this is not a problem. So my, at that point, my parents pulled me out of the school and put sent me to a new school, which was much, much better. But when I made that move from schools, I changed my name from Rowan to Roxy. And I told everybody I was from Jordan and not Iraq because I just wanted to distance myself from who I was, from where I was from. I would be you know, my mom um, and dad are Muslim. My mom would wear a headscarf. I was, I was so embarrassed. And I just remember being very, very, very insecure, Uh, really just hated who I was. I, I hated that I was different, that my parents didn't celebrate Christmas like other families. You know, and I think a lot of people, like you said, a lot of people suffer from bullying. And I think now perhaps much worse because of cyberbullying. But, you know, I think it really does, of course, affect how you feel about yourself, all your self-worth as you grow up. And I think your insecurities, they just morph into something else. So first I had an eating disorder at school. Then it was, you know about boys then it's about not having any worth with my career so I think these insecurities stem from there don't they and then they just morph into different versions yeah they they just do different things but they're it's the same vibration inside you you're carrying that same sort of lack of self-esteem do you feel that that's what you're still healing today um It's hard to say. Do you know what? I feel something has definitely shifted, I have to say, recently. So I was thinking recently about Fashion Week is coming up. And I remember for from sort of like 22 to 27, every Fashion Week, I was tested, you know, because was I going to be invited to a show? Why was she invited? I'm obviously not pretty enough. I'm not cool enough. I'm not skinny enough. I'm not this, you know, and it was always this trigger around fashion. I didn't even care about fashion. It was just another show for me to just go, I'm not popular enough. I'm not cool enough. I was constantly striving to be like, I just felt like such a loser. That's how I felt all my life. I just felt like I was a loser. And then something just shifted. I just went, I'm just going to get in my own lane. I love self-development. I don't care if this is cool or not. This is my thing and this is what I'm here for. And I just drove in my own lane. And now I think, oh my goodness, I'm so happy I did that. And now I don't feel those things anymore because I managed to grasp authenticity. And then when you're authentic, it's really hard to be truly authentic and also feel like desperate to be liked because when you're being authentic that's when you're your most empowered confident self I love this idea of your own lane and that feels like a real ownership of your purpose too because obviously we think about love purpose connection we can think about that purpose piece that actually now you're living your purpose what do you think your purpose is today Roxy oh to help people to fulfill their dreams to unlock their potential and to be the people that they actually want to be. I think that every experience I've ever had, every time I felt pain, every time I felt I wasn't good enough, it was all meant so that I could relate to people to help them transform their own journeys. Because everybody that comes to me, I feel them, you know, I feel that so deeply and I'm I'm not very far away from it. It was only a short time ago that I felt the pain that they're in now. And I see how you can transform. And so I am without doubt that my purpose is to guide people to be their best selves. Because one of the things that really stands out about you, Roxy, is that you are a total 
girl's girl, you're a woman's woman. You're very generous and loving of the feminine. Do you do you feel that about yourself? I love women. I love the women that follow me. I feel like I've got such a connection with all of them. There's such a community. I love empowering women. I feel like for sure that's what I'm here to do. But I don't feel very in touch with my feminine energy at the moment. I don't feel particularly feminine. I think it's really, you know, when you, I don't know, I definitely, another thing I want to explore with you is when you're in that sort of very work mode, which I am right now, I find it hard to get in touch with my feminine energy at the same time. I don't have much, I don't feel very sensual or anything like that. Um, But when I'm around Wolf, it's when I have an opportunity, I think, to feel more feminine because that's my motherly side even though I'm nurturing with the people that I work with it's it's different it's more that I'm trying to motivate and inspire them which is actually still quite an alpha energy it is absolutely so it's the idea of of holding these two energies at the same time but the energy where you can also be in your softness what does that feel like thinking about that in terms of a love relationship as in romantic as in romantic I would love to feel that again. It's difficult and I don't want to sound unfeminist in a way, but I would like to meet someone that makes me feel feminine, that makes me feel um, soft and, and looked after, but not in a financial sense, just someone that made me feel safe. I think that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's the key word. That's the buzzword, isn't it? So it's probably less to do with how he's going to make you feel. It's more about how you feel. And then you bring in someone who is mirroring that experience already. Oh, what do you mean by that? You feel safe enough to hold your own softness in the world and it's safe to be in that. So you find the way of nurturing that in your everyday life. And then he comes in and he's mirroring your experience of yourself, if that makes sense. So you will manifest a person who sees that in you because you will, you give permission for it in yourself. So it's less about he comes in and completes you or give, he comes in and gives you permission to be like that. It's more like you've given yourself permission and then the right relationship will manifest. Oh, I love that. And how do you do that? How do you give yourself the permission? Well, that's what we'll be doing in our sessions, Roxy. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Completely. Bring it up. I can't do it in this podcast day. We've only got 10 minutes left. <laughs> but <laughs> I do think it's exciting. And I do feel like, you know, one of the things that I, I love about your story, Roxy, and it's just it was so great to have you on the podcast, is your commitment to showing up and your commitment to going deep and stepping in, starting where you need to start, starting it at, you know, ground zero if you need to, having the courage and then turning that around and turning it around in two years. That's really powerful. And so I would love to hear from you also what you feel are the top tips for manifesting because you do manifesting workshops. So what do you share from what you've learned so far? Uh, Well, I think the main thing with manifesting, and this is really the key, is that we do not manifest from our thoughts, but we manifest from our subconscious beliefs about what we deserve and from our self-worth. So self-love is the driving force behind manifesting. So if you want to manifest anything in your life, you have to recognize the fear and doubts that are blocking you on your way there because fear and doubt are the two blocks to anything you want to manifest you need to nurture self-love around everything in your life but specifically if you're trying to manifest a promotion then you need to work on your self-worth around your career around how you feel about yourself in the workplace and I think one of the key ones that I would say here is um, understanding, and this is my step five, which is um, turn envy into inspiration. At the moment, you know, we're all on our phones more than ever. My goodness, I feel like I'm a 
on my phone all the time because it's the only way we can connect now. We can't connect in person, so we're trying to connect online. So we're always faced, we'll be scrolling through, and very easily you can be triggered with feelings of envy. And I think a lot of us get quite ashamed of that feeling with, we try to ignore it. We try to bat it off, but it sits there. Okay. But I think what's important is to stop, acknowledge that feeling and turn that envy into inspiration because envy is low vibe. Envy is, comes from a place of scarcity, which is what you will then manifest. But if you can turn that into inspiration and say, no, I'm not, jealous and not envious but actually wow isn't this gorgeous I can't wait to have that for myself that comes from a place of inspiration that says to the universe there's an abundance of love for the world and that's what you'll manifest and then you'll raise your vibe I love that that is fantastic that is spot on and amazing I love that and a really important one for these times massively important I think so yeah so when I say the words love, purpose, connection to you, Roxy, what emerges? You know what? When you say those words, I just think life. It's all we all want. And I think it's the way that when we try to find compassion for each other, we could consider that every single one of us is just looking for those three things. And when we understand that we're all together in that, you can let go of resentment, anger, jealousy, and just find that oneness with with each other. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And 2021, Roxy, what are you manifesting for 2021? Oh, well, I went to manifest... I don't know if I can say it. I don't know if I'm allowed yet. I put something on my vision board at the beginning of January and um, it's happening. So it will be announced later this year. And I'm very excited. <laughs> it's fantastic. I mean, I, th- I just think you're so inspiring, Roxy. It's wonderful. It's just really powerful. Oh, thank you so much. It's so funny because I don't do, I'm not on this side of the podcast often. I now obviously am just convinced that I sound really self-centered and I'm like, oh my God. I'm, it's, it's like, it's even though I've done so much self-development, I will, my insecurities come out at every opportunity. <laughs> but one of the things that's really incredible is your humility around, around that. Just your willingness to have own it and your willingness to share it and put it out there. And, and in doing that, we kind of let it go too yeah because it's human there's a humanity in that isn't there fear is something that we hold so it's just how we keep showing up to that you know and actually you really have not sounded even remotely self-centered on this podcast Roxy (laughs) thank you and I just you know really look forward to to seeing you and working with you thank you so much Estelle and I'm so excited for our continued journey together To find out more about Roxy, she's at Roxy Nafusi on Instagram. You can find me at Estelle.Bingham. And if you've enjoyed the show, do share it, rate it and review it if you can. This podcast is produced by Sarah Cudden with exec production from Kate Taylor. It's a Feast Collective production. Until the next one, wishing you all more love, purpose and connection.